This is the Kids and Family Track. We've had some awesome talks this morning, but I gotta say I am super excited about the panel we have coming up. Um, we're gonna be talking about Toys to Life. This category is huge, emergent. No one saw it coming a few years ago. Now it's top of mind for a wide range of folks. We have a stunning lineup of panelists who will introduce themselves in a few moments. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Shai Samet, the founder and president of the KidSafe SEAL program. These guys certify apps, websites, kid-targeted technology as safe for kids. They do a, a great job of looking out for kids' interests. And uh, I'm going to let him take it from here. Oh, one quick footnote. Um, the panel has decided to accept questions during the discussion. So if you have a question you'd like to pose to any of the panelists, raise your hand and please wait for me to come around with a mic uh, so that we can get the questions onto the video. Thanks, All right, Dave. take it away, Shai. Thank you, thank you. Thanks, Dave, and pleasure to be here. This is my second casual connect. I was at the uh, one in Tel Aviv, which was a lot of fun uh, and exciting. So <clears throat> uh, there I talked about compliance, and uh, here I have the opportunity to talk to something a lot more lively, uh, specifically toys to life. Uh, so. Uh, as Dave mentioned, uh, I run the KidSafe program. We work with lots of uh, kids app developers around the world, uh, lots of toy makers, including uh, connected toy makers, including uh, some of the folks on this panel. And we're tasked with discussing today um, issues related to product inception, uh, mechanics, success stories, and the direction of the toys to life space. So we'll try to keep true to that agenda. Um, I'm joined by Caitlin. I'm not going to pronounce na last names because I think I might butcher them, but I'm joined by Caitlin from, uh, from Leapfrog, VTech, uh, Nick from Spinmaster, uh, Sean from Anki, and uh, Orit from Sibo. So we have quite a diverse uh, group here. I think we'll start from closest to me to furthest uh, with intros. Please tell us who you are, what you do at your company, and what products you make. I feel honored that we're closest, Shai. Sounds good. <laughs> Uh, I'm Nick Belaya, and I'm the VP Production at Spin Master Studios. Uh, we really focus on bridging the gap between digital play patterns and physical play patterns, really focused on extending toys. Uh, cool. Well, you want to tell us about some of your robots and drones? Uh, sure. A uh, lot of the products we work on, uh, uh, some of the more notable ones are the mechanoid robot that came out last year. We've got the three-footer and the four-footer. Uh, we have uh, ongoing support uh, with that. We have a big update actually coming out in the next month or so. Um, we also do a lot with augmented reality. We have uh, the Airhawks Connect Mission Drone uh, coming out this fall, where it's a drone that you fly, and we transform the room into augmented reality, and so uh, you get to do really structured play in a sci-fi universe. It's a lot of fun stuff. Cool. And you guys recently acquired Tokoboka as well, which I think is noteworthy. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, the company really sees, and, and everyone with the physical uh, presence sees that uh, digital play is becoming more and more important, and uh, Tokoboka is a great acquisition for us, where they really dominate uh, the preschool and younger area with their uh, Tokoboka line and Saga Mini, and then they just soft launched a Toka TV in Canada cool. last week. Sean, tell us about Anki, please. Uh, hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Sean Levitino. I'm the lead game designer at Anki. Uh, and we are a small consumer robotics startup here in San Francisco. Um, we focus on robotic toys um, targeted at um, younger kids. Uh, so our first product uh, was called Anki Drive, um, which was kind of a um, sort of electronic live version of, uh, think of like slot cars mixed with video games. You've heard of talk about, like video games in the real world. Um, and that's been sort of our product for the last several years, and we just recently announced uh, Cosmo, which is more of a sort of companion robot, um, again, targeted towards um, sort of like eight to 10 year olds. Um, and then so we are, we're sort, of a full, we're sort of a full stack company, so we do all of the software design, hardware design, electrical engineering, sort of all in one place. Hi, um, I'm Orit Wall and I uh, lead the US business development activities for SIBO. SIBO is an N10 IoT platform, um, Internet of Things platform, empowering any product team uh, to develop smart connected products easily, quickly, um, and cost effectively. 
what we do is we provide these product companies with um, technologies and tools such as um, virtualized planning and ideation tools, uh, quick prototyping, uh, smart app SDK and uh, simulator, um, Internet of Things firmware libraries, and also connecting them with IoT experts um, to ensure the success of the process. We actually started out um, for about four years ago in the toy industry. So what we, we realized that uh, kids are expecting more from their toys. Um, and and they are they're wanting toys to become smarter and smarter, um, but also that in order for toy companies to do that or um, product companies in general, there are a lot of challenges and difficulties in developing smart products. Um, later on, we realized that these same challenges are the same that every product uh, team faces, uh, no matter if you're a mattress company or pets, um, luggage. Um, travel and so on and so on. Um, everyone faces basically the same challenges, so we expanded our platform to uh, allow any development team to uh, develop smart products. My name is Caitlin Goodekunst. Um, I lead the licensing inventor concepts and business development efforts at LeapFrog, recently purchased by VTech, so now representing both brands. Um, my background is sort of touches all across the toy industry, so I've worked on television properties um, and also digital worlds for kids with Moshi Monsters. Um, at LeapFrog, our mission is to, pr is to help every child achieve their potential through the production of um, interactive educational toys with an, enter with an electronic um, background most of the time. But we also do do interactive um, non-screen-based toys as well. So um, we really approach our uh, portfolio holistically in order to bring interactivity in many different ways um, from zero to eight-year-old kids. Okay, do you want to tell everyone about the TAG pen? Perhaps that's what you were Sure. Sure. Um, well, LeapFrog's been around for 21 years. Um, our original product portfolio really was rooted in literacy as the foundation for most edu uh, an educational empowerment for kids. And so the first product that came out was our, our Leap Pad, and that was using a technology with a, a camera, um, interacting with some, um, with reading a, the page in order to um, bring the page to life in a new way. And so the next iteration of the Leap Pad was the Leap Reader. Um, and we've re just recently announced that we're reinventing that, um, sort of harking back to the original Leap Pad with the Leap Starts inter interactive reading system. Um, so while recently most of our product portfolio was screen-based with Leap Pads, um, really successful in 2012-2013, um, this is actually a non-screen-based interactive activity platform. So rather than being more storybooks um, and guiding kids through um, a, a empowering story, um, it's, it's actually mini games um, that can be, have replay value. Just looking at the interactivity that kids expect from having digital devices in their pockets all the time. Great, thanks, thanks for the intro. So uh, I'd like to touch on three topics today and, and please, um, we welcome audience participation. We have a small group here, so we'd like to keep it intimate. Um, we're gonna talk about um, some techniques and strategies for designing, uh, developing, uh, and, and also conceiving of a great uh, connected product, a connected toy product. Uh, we'll then jump into some <clears throat> success strategies for monetization for business models in this area. And then we'll conclude with some thoughts around where the industry is, is headed. Uh, to start, you know, one of the things that we uh, at KidSafe have, have learned by testing lots of toy connected products is that it's very difficult to develop a simple connected toy. One that's not clunky, um, but that also has some depth to the game experience. So I'd like to ask the panelists, you know, what, what are the tricks to coming up with a simple design um, so that kids can quickly understand what they're doing and how to play with it? And let's start with, uh, with you, Sean, uh, with the Anki track. Oh, you put me on right in the spot. Yeah. Um, so I think definitely uh, that is one of the biggest challenges because this segment is very new and, you know, every product is very much sort of starting from scratch in terms of figuring out what the interactions are, like how do you... How do you play with the toy? How do you interact with it? Especially if there's a, if it's connected to a phone, like how does the app work? A lot of those sort of metaphors that we have, um, that people learn from video games, from other interactions, from other toys, don't necessarily map exactly one to one. So there's a lot of sort of learning and teaching involved in that. Um, and everyone sort of, every product you go to, everyone has to sort of learn 
all over again exactly how to interact with that product. So at Aki, um, you know, the first version of Drive that we had, uh, we, we, you know, we tried to be as simple as we possibly could with the track layout for the cars to drive around. And so we, we sort of shipped a very large single piece of track. And it's like, oh, this is the easiest thing. There's no assembly, there's, there's no parts to put together, there's nothing to get lost. It's just like a big vinyl track. You just roll out and it's like one piece and it's just done. There's, there's no possible way to get it wrong. Um, and it was very, very simple. Um, but what we found is that um, what we sort of lost with that was that sense of um, customization, that sense of personal expression, that sense of being able to take a couple different track pieces and build wildly different tracks and different experiences and that sort of like Lego sense of putting things together, getting a bunch of sort of basic pieces and building your own experience out of that. And I think that was that was sort of when we, when we did a re revision up to Overdrive that came out uh, last year, that was, you know, we replaced the si single big track with a bunch of modular track pieces that just sort of snapped together very easily. And then we had a huge response from it because now this was like a whole dimension of play for people where you know, it was technically a little bit more complicated, but allowed for like much more expression of the game space and how you set it up and how you customize it. And then now this was a thing that parents and kids could do together. Um, and I think that there's a sort of a sense where it was actually, it was, it was technically more complicated and there was more pieces there, but the interaction was a little bit easier because it sort of relied on everyone sort of like our learned social knowledge of having you know old slot cars or old track pieces where it's like oh yeah I know I put these together and I build a thing so there's there's a big difference between I guess um, like the technical compl complexity of what you're building and then sort of the sort of learned social complexity of do people understand what they're supposed to do with this without having sort of had these like big complicated instructions and so now you can build the tracks right you overdrive you can actually assemble, piece together the tracks? Yeah, so as what, what that does for Overdrive is one, you can assemble the tracks, we, so we ship with a sort of starter kit with 10 pieces and you can build, uh, I think, eight different tracks out of it, but it also allows us to sell sort of uh, extra track pieces as an accessory add-on, and what that does, it gives us um, a way for people to sort of have uh, a very inexpensive way to sort of increase their overall experience very easily, so because Unfortunately, with a lot of robotics, robotics can be expensive. So having, having a, a really inexpensive way to be like, okay, I only want to spend a couple dollars and get a small increase the experience and sort of build the track bigger and bigger, have more pieces, have more, more variability, that sort of more customization sort of gives us a scale of ways for sort of customers to interact with the experience. And it certainly gives Anki a way to make more money, right? I mean, I mean how much is an extra piece of uh, track cost? or a starter kit versus a more built out? I mean, I think the, the track pieces are definitely much, much uh, easier and cheaper for us to manufacture because there are no electronics. Right. It, is, it, is, you know, plast it is plastic and paint um, and magnets versus mm. um, sort of much more expensive like electronics and chips and radios and things like that. So right. it lets us, it certainly, it certainly, like I said, it gives us a scale of sort of things to sell. Nick, how about mechanoid? I mean, mechanoid, anybody, everyone in this room know what mechanoid is? What it looks like? Okay. Well, it looks, I mean, when you look at it, it looks pretty complex. So is it, is it complex or is it simple? Uh, it, it's a little of each. So uh, mechanoid, for those who don't know, Meccano was what the rest of the world called a rector set. So if you guys are all familiar with the rector set, bought them about four years ago, decided to go with the universal brand. Uh, and name it uh, mechanoid. So uh, the larger robot is about 1,100 pieces to build, uh, and it's very much uh, a family activity. You know, it's it's normally you know fathers and their children in particular. Um, it's 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 real engineering uh, at that point. Um, and so at at that point, uh, the construction itself is is definitely an intense task. But when you get to the app interaction and you're using the eight servos and the mecha brain uh, and you're programming with that, uh, with that we brought simplicity into it. So um, we have the ability to create uh, animations and it's just really simple slider tools and then the robot will do it. Um, we have 
uh, voice recognition coming out where you can talk back and forth with it. There's already uh, some pre canned stuff where there's about a thousand different interactions that you can have with a robot. And we focus really on intuitive things, right? If you're going to talk to a robot, it's going to answer back. If you're going to animate it, it's going to do the moves. Uh, mm. And then the big thing I mentioned earlier is uh, we'll be opening up with a really simple uh, programming language for people to get uh, more and more control of the robot itself. Cool, cool. I can tell you that um, we also have in our office uh, the Dash and Dot robot. Anyone familiar with that one from Wonder Workshop? So uh, my son has been using it to program his voice into the robot and send the, send the robot into my office. Anytime he wants to ask me for something that he knows face to face, he won't get. <laughs> so anyway, you know, I'll have it come in and say, hey, Dad, can you take me to the restaurant tonight? And uh, Anyway, that's how he uses it. It's pretty straightforward on how to do that. Um, okay, then tell us about you know, whether you design something as a toy versus a game and, and sort of how you look at uh, things from that perspective and how it's impacted sort of LeapFrog's approach to its reading books. Uh, so I actually want to go back also to the simplicity in design. And um, LeapFrog's consumers are in the younger subset, so it's a little different than what Nick or Anki would be looking at. Um, so we actually have to design with kids and parents in mind in a different sort of way because parents are often called in to help power through that experience if they're non-readers or if the kids don't have the man manipulative abilities to use the tools for everything. So we design everything to be extremely kid-centric in the way that you can use the tools. So um, we also have, uh, as as Sean said, a full stack experience the way that we approach the design of all of our toys. And so um, the, the tablets as a good example or the reading system, um, the hardware is designed in-house, the firmware, the software that goes through that, the ecosystem that powers it, and then also the content. Um, we actually have a full scope and sequence um, which maps out different ages for kids to skill sets that they would need to be able to continue to accelerate into the next grade level or through preschool. And all of our products um, roll up into that. So when we're designing products, whether it's um, a, a plush, interactive plush like our Scout, or if it's a tablet or a game that's on the tablet, all of those skills are actually um, the, the same across the whole portfolio. So that helps us with brand consistency and also helps us, uh, the parent, understand exactly um, when they should be making purchases um, and also the designers themselves and how they can design um, the different games for, for the correct age group. Um, so when you're approaching a game versus a toy or one that, that goes into both the physical and digital sphere, I always just urge people to be extremely consumer centric. Um, make sure that you test things, make sure that there's intrinsic play value in whatever channel. Um, I think the magic of some of the toys that we're representing here is that when you're, if you don't have the apps, you can still play with the toys and really love them without that additional layer of interactivity, um, which is true for um, uh, in an inter interactive plush, for example, it's a huggable plush, and that is a core play value for kids. It's a nurturing sort of um, object for them. Um, but if the plush also then says their name when you tickle them, then all of a sudden it's a buddy that has a different layer of interactivity. I think that's yeah, yeah. Thank you. So Arid, uh, you know, building on that, I know you've worked with uh, a number of companies um, with plush dolls or, or related dolls. Um, talk about the simplicity. I mean, is it, is it helpful to work with an outsourced company like you to build in simplicity uh, to something like that? Yeah, so just um, going back to talking about the designing, I think the key, one of the key factors in designing um, a good connected toy or a connected product in general is uh, user testing. And um, to be able to do that, you need to uh, be able to quickly prototype. So you know, um, you're designing, and then you're testing and learning, and then going back to the product to change it. And what's great about um, connected products is that the um, testing uh, doesn't have to end after the product is out in the market. One of our toy clients um, designed a toy with figurines, and he, he thought that one of the figurines would dominate the, the gameplay. But then after the kids already had the toy in the market, he, f he realized that a, another figurine was uh, the more dominant one. Kids played with the most uh, over uh, 90 minute sessions or longer. And he used that data in order to change the gameplay in the app itself, but also in future versions of the physical toy. So I think that um, once 
uh, designing connected products, the, the, the user testing and uh, prototyping is very, very important, but it's also, uh, you, can, you can do it constantly even, even after the product's out in market. Um, in terms of uh, doing it uh, in-house or using a platform, so when you're developing a smart product, there are many things to consider. Um, who's gonna take care of the analytics, what kind of sensors am, um, will I be using, what kind of connectivity solution will I be using, will it be Wi-Fi, will it be Bluetooth, um, how do I manage uh, the firmware development, how do I manage the app development, how do I integrate both efficiently. Um, and in order to do that, if you want to do it in-house, you have to make sure you have all the right expertise, all the right people that have the expertise to do that, or you'll need to hire them, which might take, um, might be a long process and a very costly process. Um, if you decide to work with an outside platform or doing it with the right partner, um, that can relieve a lot of the risks and the cost in doing that because the process could be much, much more quick, quicker and, um, and seamless. Um, and also, uh, what's great about working with an outside platform is that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. So there are platforms that are doing handling, for example, software updates, security. Um, why, why go and develop that and, and focus your time on infrastructure when you can um, focus your time on, on invention and then using an outside platform? So we'll come back to the technical, uh, some of the technical aspects that you're discussing. Um, but I know Nick, you wanted to share something. I, I just want to make sure that we don't confuse sort of uh, simplicity with, with sort of talking to kids and kids. They've grown up with the technology. They are fearless. They are so comfortable with it. Yeah. And if you pander to them or dumb it down or something like that, they will see through it in a heartbeat and walk away, right? And so sure. it's a matter of, I think, more accessibility, treating them with respect, uh, but making it a, a really solid user experience. because. Oh man, they're they're so sophisticated. True, and they want a cool experience, no question. Um, I know for my for my sake at least, you know, when when interacting with some of these products, um, you know, one of the products that we worked with is a Hello Barbie doll, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, and that particular technology required a Wi-Fi connection. So I was the one who had to set up the Wi-Fi connection, which was relatively straightforward. Um, and then the kid, the younger kid, girl or boy, actually my, my son loves talking to Barbie as well. But the, the kid is the one who interacts with the product itself, and that was relatively straightforward. But I can't also overemphasize how a lot of times the first iteration of the product has to work well. Um, can't have battery issues, can't have connectivity issues, because uh, sometimes that can determine the fate of the, of the pro product long term. Um, so t st since you still have the mic, um, Nick, tell us, Tell us, you know, what is the significance of, of there being sort of the, the physical aspect of the toy having some interactive engagement, right? So when we look at products like Skylanders or Infinity, and we all know that Disney has announced that they're discontinuing that particular product line, what does that tell us about the physical toy itself and the level of interactivity it needs to have on its own? Sure. I, I think in general you want the most activity you can possibly get into it. Um, I think that when you look, you know, particularly the the 1.0 versions of Infinity or Skylanders or, or Dimensions or anything like that, uh, there was less interactivity. And I think that the market's moving towards more where I, I think like Caitlin was saying a little bit earlier, you want some sort of intrinsic toy value uh, in the toy itself. So when you're not interacting with that digital experience, you can still stay connected with it. There's a play pattern there. And with some of the things, it's just a statue. Uh, there's not really an intrinsic play pattern. There's not something that there's not something like, hey, I'm having a real good time playing with the toy. Oh, and that good time is now going to draw me back to the physical world. And so I really think that's that next level is that interactivity is this real hook for that broader physical, digital connected universe. Are there folks in this room that have toys work for toy companies or connected toy products? No? Okay. Is yours, does your toy or connected product have interactivity of its own? So it needs 
to work in each thanks Dave <laughs> in each situation. Yeah. Choice to life, not statuary. There you go. Okay, hence hence the title. Um, okay, then you want to add anything to this this discussion? Um, since my title has licensing in it, I want to go back to the brand factor, actually. Um, so one of the things that's really beautiful about Skylanders is they're taking Spyro the Dragon, which is a game that had a lot of wonderful memories for kids, and they're reinventing it as a property. So there's, there's licensed Skylanders things out there in addition to just the toys. So um, there is actually some great sentimental value in being able to carry those statues around. I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you, I'm just saying that if you, if you take it into effect as a character perspective, um, even when you're not using that, um, the, the Skylanders figurine in the game, um, kids, I've, I've watched kids take them to the pool and say, oh no mom, don't get my Skylander wet, let's, let's put him in his, this little beach bag, and I'm just watching it, like, it's just a little statue, <laughs> like, it's not a big thing, but for kids, um, they, they want to be able to take these characters which are so pervasive due to the accessibility that they have to Netflix and driving their own entertainment consumption with tablets um, personalized for them and their screens. They want to be able to propel that um, character experience and, and even the game experience, the connectivity to those games through other aspects of their lives. And you can't always do it with connected experiences. So the fact that the that Skylanders does actually have a uh, a sentimental value for kids, or, or a plush version of that, um, does extend the play value in a sense for them. So let's let's wrap up this discussion about yeah. product design real quick, and and just ask a, a, for quick comments on parents. Do parents need to be involved in the toy play experience at all in order for it to be successful? Yes, no. Quickly, let's get a short comment from each of you. Yeah. Um, I would say yes, uh, no. It, do they have to be? Yeah. Uh, no, but it's great if they are. Um, okay. It's not required, but it's a, it's a great bonus. Okay, then. So for me, since a lot of mine are interactive experiences based on screens, there's a lot of guilt for parents um, in association with screens. So there's actually sort of this um, reaction right now to traditional values and parents wanting to have um, those moments where they can have, play with their kids. So Anki's a really great example. Um, mom or dad and, and child can actually build the tracks together and then mom can step away and go cook dinner and the child has the ability to play by themselves or with um, a tablet. Mom might help set up or download a game and then say, here, I, I trust that this is a leapfrog game. It's educational. The kid loves Doc McStuffins and now you can play this game by yourself and I can go cook dinner <laughs> and know that you're going to be okay. Are we? Um, I think it depends on the age of the, the kids. Um, and you know the, the younger kids, um, it, obviously, it, they need their parents there to help them with it um, or to support it. But they also want to feel that independency where they can play it by themselves. Um, the older kids don't need it so much. So I think it's a combination and depending on the age of the kids. Nick? Yeah, I, I actually second that, right? It, it, it's all about the age of the kid, uh, developing the bond, you know, when, when they're younger, bring them along to the point where they're confident enough uh, that they don't need mom or dad anymore and they're gonna do what they wanna do and develop that independent spirit. Okay, great. So let's uh, uh, speak a few minutes on the technical configurations of these products, uh, the preferred technical configuration, and then we'll talk about uh, business models and, and monetization strategies. Um, Ori, you mentioned earlier Bluetooth connectivity versus Wi-Fi. Um, we have seen at least that there's, an L, there's benefit to having purely a Bluetooth connection between mobile app and toy or device or, or product simply because you don't need an internet connection. Um, you, don't, you don't need to be connected to a Wi-Fi network per se. And there might also be some security related concerns or benefits uh, not being connected to an unsecure network, right? Which happens a lot of times in the home environment. Um, any thoughts on that? Preference, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, does it depend? Yeah, so it really depends on the functionality of the, of the toy um, or the product in general. If, if um, you want the, the product to be dependent on an app and if it's okay that it will work, the smartness will work only when connected in the app, yeah, then go ahead and do Bluetooth because it's simpler. Um, it's, it's cheaper than Wi-Fi and you have uh, less security issues to handle with it. But some products, um, like um, Smart Home, for example, you want it to continue on working even if you're not there to connect it to an app. So you want it to be connected to Wi-Fi to the cloud directly. 
There you, um, it's more complicated in a way where you have to deal with um, server and cloud management, um, device management analytics, security, more security issues, and so on. But there's also uh, benefits of getting uh, more data transferred um, in terms of speed and the bandwidth of the data that you can transfer. So Sean, in the case of Anki, the cars are controlled by the mobile app via Bluetooth connection? Correct. And then, but the app obviously uploads data to the web, so the, the cars themselves are not connected to the internet. Correct, so uh, Bluetooth, uh, specifically Bluetooth Low Energy, uh, has been a godsend for us. Um, and I think it's, uh, whenever possible, I think is, is definitely like the preferred connection, um, because it is very fast, you don't have to do explicit pairing. Um, you know, you can multiplex, you can see, you know, for us, we can control up to four vehicles uh, at once through a single app, um, all through Bluetooth, so you can have multiple connections at once. Um, you know, obviously, Bluetooth Low Energy has throughput issues. Um, you know, you're not going to be pushing a lot of data over it. Um, mm -hmm. But if you can, if you can develop your product in such a way that your connection from the toy to to the app, if you're doing obviously a connected thing, um, you, if you don't need a huge amount of bandwidth, um, then I think Bluetooth is really great. So in our case, yeah, we have, you know, the phones connect connect to the cars through Bluetooth. Uh, they control all the cars through Bluetooth. There's no internet connection required. Um, and we just, that is, that is sort of the loop. And then even the phone, so in the original version of, of Anki Drive and in Overdrive with the iOS version, uh, we can do phone to phone communication through Bluetooth. So you can actually play Anki Drive with four players and four cars in the middle of the desert where there's no signal and no Wi Fi and no anything. Uh, and that's really great for us because we got an experience where, you know, what we saw, you know, because our play patterns, we see a huge spike in play during holidays. And a lot of people, you know, they'll take a track out when family comes over and like, oh, just download the app, install it. You don't have to get on their Wi-Fi. You don't have to like get everyone together. Just, as long as the phones are within 30 feet of each other, everyone can play a game. It all just sort of works. Um, so I think that that has been really huge, really advantageous to us. And you said we're making sort of like simple interactions, even though the, the sort of tech is fairly complex. Um, it, makes a, it makes sort of the experience just kind of work. So, um, since you mentioned it, do people actually play Anki in the desert, four or five people? Is it? Uh, if if they might, uh, if they if they do, we wouldn't get we, might, uh, we wouldn't get any information from it. Might be a good, <laughs> might be a good promo, <laughs> might be a good promo video. Yeah. Um, uh, so, Kaylin, how about how about in the case of Leapfrog? Uh, any distinctions around? I know that some of the older products have had a direct Wi-Fi connection, so you can track the child's progress and play patterns. Actually, most of the old products were hard connect to the computer. So, um, I mean, one of the beauties of having connected products is it allows you to upgrade the products and improve them, which mm -hmm. is a great experience, but also allows you to re-engage with your consumers and to continue to push them updates and more um, content. And so it, that's really mm -hmm. the, the benefit for us. Um, our, our first Wi-Fi enabled tablet was introduced in 2014 with the LeapPad Ultra. And um, our most recent tablet, the LeapPad Epic, which came out last year, our first Android-based um, tablet, our effort towards opening up our ecosystem right. ever slightly, <laughs> um, that allows you to be able to transfer um, these large um, Nintendo DS-sized games mm. um, to your tablet instead of having to go the, the experience before was you would download a game um, on a web portal and then push that through a hard connect to the tablets, which was somewhat clunky. Um, I don't think parents enjoyed doing it. I certainly didn't as a partner before I came in-house to LeapFrog. Um, and Wi-Fi just makes that much much easier for a transfer. OK, great. Um, you're good? We can move on? We can move on. OK, good. Uh, OK, great. Well, just to close out the, the, the sort of the technical aspects of product configurations in this space, obviously you want to look at um, security, privacy, and safety considerations. Um, you know, the FTC recently brought an enforcement action against one of the ad networks uh, called In Inmobi. Uh, and they were technically fined $4 million for tracking, although they could only pay a million of it. But they were, uh, they were fined $4 million for tracking children's geolocations. Um, within any of the child-directed apps that had their geo-tracking technology enabled, even though they said that they were not doing that. Um, so obviously they were, they were penalized for that, but you do want to look at sort of the, some of these distinctions from a privacy and security standpoint. Is a Bluetooth connection more secure? Um, obviously Wi-Fi raises some concerns around uploading data to the internet. 
um, especially if it's data that might be considered sensitive or personal to a child, um, whether it's a photo or a voice or things of that nature. Um, and we've seen the industry express concerns about that. The other thing to note is that the FTC under the COPPA law just raised the per violation fee that they can impose on you if you violate the law. It used to be 16,000 and now it's 40,000. Um, so the consequences per violation, uh, and that might be per child. So the consequences can be quite steep and significant um, if you don't get that, if you don't get that right. Um, let's move to sustainability. Um, business models, sustainability, monetization. Uh, and let's start with, you know, you've got a great toy, you've developed a great product, you've done all the right things, it works, um, doesn't pose any safety or security concerns. How do you get kids to keep playing with it? Uh, that, that's the secret sauce that keeps us all in business, right? <laughs> well, share some of that, please. <laughs> so uh, it, it, it's, it's really engagement, right? It, it's, it's keeping them engaged to the, the full cycle. So we spent a huge amount of time thinking about this with the, the Mission Drone and Augmented Reality project we're doing where it's a drone, it's an RC vehicle, and so you have a certain amount of time while it's charged, and then you have a longer time while it's recharging. Mm. And, and you know, the key is like, how can you keep them uh, engaged with the toy when the toy is doing that lovely thing of being plugged into a socket somewhere? Um, so when you're, you're flying, you're having fun with the drone. Uh, if you're in the augmented reality universe, uh, you're doing missions, you're rescuing people, you're having structured play with an RC. And that's really sort of how we're plussing up the core RC play is, well, what do I do with it? Well, you can, you know, fight aliens, rescue people, put up burning buildings, but then when it's offline, how do you keep them engaged uh, when it's in a plug and not exciting? Well, at that point, we keep the, the AR triggers and you can play in the, in the AR universe and still have that physical digital connection. You've got the pilot of the drone and the firefighter that puts out the fires and the engineer that mans the grappling hook um, and the, uh, the commando that jumps out and, and rescues civilians and fight guys. You do training missions with each one augmented reality, danger dome, it's kind of like the X-Men danger room type thing. You learn techniques that you can then apply back to the physical game. You have a whole series of power-ups and unlockables uh, that, that you do. Uh, and basically everything that you're doing in that recharge play mode goes back into the physical mode. And so you have this really great compulsion loop where they're like, wow, I finished with all this. Uh, now my timer's gone off and the drone's ready to fly again. I've unlocked all these new things that I get to try out. And I think that's a really interesting thing when we talk about the connectivity that we just were between the physical product and the digital in something like this where we've got complete control via Bluetooth of all the telemetry within the drone. If you have unlocked a power up that makes the drone fly faster, we will make the physical drone fly faster than it was a few seconds ago. Mm. If you have a uh, maneuverability power up, we will change the rotation of each individual rotor. So yeah, it is easier to fly now, or it is more maneuverable. And being able to take those sort of digital video game tropes and apply them to the physical universe, uh, it's, it's very satisfying to have such a visceral experience like that. Sean, any secret sauce? Uh, I think just sort of building on, on what Nick talked about, which was the ex sort of the experience yourself. So the experience you purchase is a dynamic experience you can have you, know, you can leverage a lot of what we've learned in video games over the past you know, 5, 10, 15 years about progression, about having a dynamic experience, about having a sense of you know, building, up, building up a sense of power, building up a sense of um, sort of expertise within whatever the sort of specific sort of interactions that you're building. Um, I think at Anki, we have sort of a two-pronged approach to that. So you have sort of, that's sort of the product itself. That's sort of like the experience that you sell to somebody. Um, and I think the, the other two ways to sort of build on that are one is having that sort of that total umbrella of experience being able to grow over time. So one of the great things about having a connected product that sort of has an app-based experience is you can always push software updates. You can push new experiences. You know, for Anki, for OverDrive, we have a whole series of sort of AI um, commanders, we call them, which is sort of like AI personalities that you can play against. So if you don't have another player to drive against, we have a whole sort of a plethora of characters who have their own, their own voices, um, they're all fully voiced, they all have their own script, they all have their own personalities, they have their own driving styles, they have their own AI settings, their own difficulty levels that you can sort of work through. But you know, every 
every month or every four months or every six months, we can push new commanders, new game modes, new weapons, new items, new, you know, all sorts of new stuff to sort of keep the sort of the total umbrella and the total sort of bubble of the experience getting larger. Um, and I would say, you know, at the same time, you know, for us, all those updates are free. You know, you have the option of monetizing if that fits your product. Uh, you know, Anki specifically, we choose not to. Um, but for us, because we also have, like I sort of mentioned earlier, we have sort of a whole catalog of accessories. So the idea is, you know, once you've bought a product, once you've bought sort of for us, it's a starter kit, you can sell other sort of smaller add-ons to that. So, you know, for us, you know, when you first purchase the product, you, you come, it comes with two cars, but there's four or six other vehicles that are, have, you know, their own items, their own weapons, their own game modes, all these sort of things built into them that sort of expand the experience. Also, like we mentioned before, the tracks, be able to have really low cost, easy entry point accessories that you can purchase. Um, for us, it's that track pieces where it's much less than, a, it's much less than another robot, um, but still expands the experience. So for us, we can say, hey, with that starter kit, you know, it comes with uh, 10 track pieces. You can build eight tracks, but if you just spend another $20 for a couple more track pieces, you, you can now build 20 or 30 tracks. And because of sort of the networking effect, very small, very small purchases create huge amounts of variability. Um, and sort of the, the total sort of play space that you inhabit for your product can grow very exponentially. Um, so part of that is in product design, part of that is obviously in marketing, part of that is you know, obviously the cost of these things, like how you manufacture them, what your cogs are, things like that. Like all that sort of has to be, it's very hard to do that after the fact. I think you sort of have to build that sort of into the core concept of the product. Um, I think that's what we learned with Anki Drive was that we sort of realized like, oh, we want to do these things. Okay, that's why we made Overdrive. Like we sort of had to like start over again. Um, so I think when you think about these things, when you think about, you know, what is the lifeline of the product? How, are, how am I going to sort of re-engage my customers after that initial purchase, I think that's the sort of thing that has to be core to the product um, and core to the design because if it's just a sort of like a, a cheap add-on, I think people, like Nick said, like people are very sophisticated. They understand that. Um, they know when you're trying to nickel and dime them. Um, so I think you have to sort of, you sort of have these things that really fundamentally change the experience. People will really engage with it. Oh, oh Reed, how, how, how frequently do you recommend toy makers to come out with the next iteration of a connected toy product? Um, wow, that's a good question. Um, it, it really depends on um, the costs involved in doing that, but also on um, the data that they're getting from the play, play usage. Um, I mean, if they're seeing that. Right now, um, um, they came out with four figurines, and three of them aren't played much, then okay, let's go and change the app and think of ch how, um, how, we, how can we change the physical product as well. So it really depends, yeah, and, and there's a lot of costs involved in it, and um, getting, and seconding what, what Sean just said, um, um, getting details about the costing as, as early as possible in the process, in the design phase, is, <laughs> is, um, is, it, is crucial for, th for the success, getting that feedback, um, so that you're not spending time developing something that you know, would be great and sounds great, but then in terms of retail price, won't work, because the pr right retail price is crucial for um, the success of the toy. And just talking about specifically monetization and business models, zooming out to Internet of Things in general, I think that connected products opens up totally new business models and opportunities. Uh, for example, think of a toothbrush. So someone's selling a toothbrush, but if you're selling connected toothbrush, it opens up um, a, business, a new opportunity of not only gaining monetization by um, se the sales of the toothbrush, but also um, the more you brush, the more um, um, better dental, plan, dental insurance plans you can get. That's one example. Another example is a luggage company, one of our clients that um, they can go and they can gamify the journey that a client has with their luggage and uh, provide promotions to the other products based on that gamification. So there are a lot of new business models and ways to monetize uh, um, you know, in connected products than in traditional products. And what's great about it is that um, you can decide in the beginning how you're gonna monetize or what your business models are gonna be, but sometimes the data that you're getting is so significant that it will open up totally new business models um, in the future. So we have about 10 minutes and let's, let's stay on that topic, monetization. Uh, considering you've got a physical product as well as the digital product, um, 
okay then, which one takes precedence? Which one should you, where should the money be coming from? Should it be both? And how do we balance those two? So I think being in the toy space, um, when apps became really popular and kids started putting smartphones for four or $500 um, electronic devices on their Christmas list, everybody freaked out in the toy industry and said, oh gosh, how do we compete with this? And um, we've seen that parents really don't have a willingness to open up their purses for, for content. And so um, being in the content space, um, we've had to really reevaluate what that means for us and how do you continue to build in the value that consumers expect from every single experience, whether it's a toy or a, an app and, or a connected toy. Um, how do you continue to deliver what the consumers are expecting or what the, the kids, digital natives, are expecting? Um, so I think you have to continue to make really great toys that um, are sustainable, of course, your business model. But then I, I think you also have to un think about how you're going to communicate that value to parents and say, um, well, I, mean, I think in the toy space, 25 is sort of like the magic number where parents are like, okay, 25, 20, it's around that space where they're like, yeah, okay, you can have it, right? So how do you deliver something that's in the right price point, um, but then also that the parent's not gonna say, but I don't understand what it does. Um, I, if I can give a quick example, we introduced um, a line of content called Magic Cards last year. It was, um, came out of a lot of research that we had done around um, the advent of Skylanders and Disney Infinity and looking at those games to life experiences and how do we continue to deliver value in the physical space with the games that we are creating. And so the way that we packaged the games, which were a full experience um, in line with our $25 um, content that we um, usually put out in the market um, by doing a pack of cards in a blister pack which was also $25. And so it wasn't a runaway hit for us last fall. And I think the reason, going back to it and doing a lot of research around it, was when parents were playing it and introduced to it in a, in a kid testing setting, um, they immediately understood manipulatives are great. It reinforces the, the learning and the play value. There's collaboration. I get it. But then when they see it on shelves and you've got the five seconds of their attention, they're like, it's a pack of cards. It's not $25. And they walked away. So how do you continue to deliver a marketing um, campaign that it reinforces the value of that experience and how often the kids can get updates for it and, and great content. Sean, so she mentioned $25, $35 price points. We know that Anki is a lot more. I think it's over $100 um, for the combined starter kit. Uh, how do you get away with that? And, and does it depend on who you're selling it to? Is it mom or dad? Um, do more dads play with Anki Drive and boys? Uh, does that make a distinction as well in the pricing uh, framework? Uh, I think it definitely does. I think it depends on w what, how, and how you're targeting. Um, I'm not a marketing expert, so I'm going to caveat all of this because uh, I just do game design. Um, but I think from from the standpoint from the standpoint of Anki, you know, we are a premium product. You know, I think the the starter kit for Overdrive is 135 between 135 and 150, depending on. Uh, when you're buying and who you're buying from. Um, and that is a premium purchase. That is not a, that is not a sought in Target on a random Saturday, and my kid really want it. I'm like, oh, okay, I'll just buy this sort of thing. Um, and if you can do that, that's awesome, congrats. Uh, but, um, you know, what we found is that, you know, we are, you know, at that price point, we are a Christmas purchase. You know, we are the sort of thing that, like, people will so say, like, a kid will see it, he'll want it, he'll, he'll ask for it, he'll beg for it for months, and then sort of like, hey, this is gonna go on. This is for that really special time, a birthday or Christmas or things like that. Um, and I think for us, we're able to, we were able to do that because, you know, because we have that sort of ecosystem that you can engage with afterwards. For us, it's not just the starter kit purchase, it's the add-on accessory purchases that can come afterwards throughout the year at a much lower price point. You know, I think Kayla said, like, once you get into that sub-$20 range, it becomes, that's kind of like the magic number with, where at which point people feel okay sort of doing things sort of on a whim on a random Saturday because I'm walking through Target and I saw it's like, oh yeah, that's the thing we already have and I can buy this and I can sort of like make everything better. Um, so I think figuring out where you are in that line if you want to be sort of the premium purchase that someone's going to be asking for and like saving up for or if you want to be the sort of impulse purchase um, right. that can sort of like someone can be like can see on the store shelves like oh that looks cool I'll just grab it and see how awesome it is. Um, I think you sort of like I said it, that's part of product planning and, and obviously part of all of your design and 
hardware design and everything else that comes out to sort of figuring out where, where you're going to end up on that marketing spectrum. And does the product category matter? So for example, you know, if you're selling to the preschool market, is there an expectation for a price point versus robotics? which people think you know, are more sophisticated and should cost more money. And you sell a $400 robot. How do you, how do you guys do that? We, we also sell like $2 toys as well. That's true. Uh, <laughs> at 99 cent stores are a big part Board of games. Our, our business right now. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so I think there's a, there's a few different things going on. There's seasonality that Sean touched on a little bit. When it's the holiday season at the end of the year, people are really you know, more apt to make that bigger purchase mm-hmm. versus it's springtime, there's no like buying driver for, for a parent or someone, so they're a little bit less uh, or price tolerant or maybe more price intolerant. Um, so that matters, but it's also the value equation of what it is you're getting. You know, are you setting them a, a, a premium product? How are you uh, defining that to them? Are they getting the real value there? But I think the, the real thing when we're talking about this physical and digital mix is how are you extending that play experience over time? How are you giving value to the customer and so I think like like Sean we charge for the toy we don't charge for the app um, mm-hmm. and I think that's an important part of the equation because when you're spending like $400 for a robot or $150 on a drone uh, you're like, that's enough and as a parent you want to be able to put controls on it brakes on it so then content consumption becomes the real issue and so when you think about the digital part of your design consumers are always going to consume content faster than you can create it right it's, it's just a universal truth. So as game designers, that's, that's where sort of the, the digital value sort of comes in and augments that core physical play. Because if you can create systemic game design where you don't have to handcraft every single thing, uh, that's where you can create a huge amount of value that's not labor intensive. And so as an example, like in, the, in our Mission Drone product, we do procedurally generated levels. So it's like Diablo. So every time you go in, it's a little bit different. You know, there's different buildings and different spaces. Maybe this time it's it's burning, and this time it isn't. And so that way, there's a different play time and a different level every single time they go in. But for us, we're done, right? We can walk away. We can do updates to make things better, but we don't have to focus on creating content over time when we're not really going to be selling them more and more content. Cool. So I'll pose one last question. I just want to also, as part of this topic, just mention that you should also consider what your retail strategy should be, whether you go direct to consumer, uh, do you go exclusive with Apple if you've got an iOS-based product, um, or do you, you know, open it up to uh, all potential retailers? Uh, so I think that's uh, another consideration to think about when you're strategizing around uh, marketing and, uh, and sales. Um, so we'll conclude with this. Uh, the last part of this the agenda is to talk about where the industry is headed. Um, so in a few words of le- or less, I'll ask each of you just to tell us what your thoughts on are where the connected toy product space is headed. Um, are we going to see more augmented reality? Um, are we going to see Angry Birds in the form of Pokemon Go? Or, uh, or are we still going to have toys out there? Uh, it, nothing is ever binary. Toys are never going to go away. Right, and I think they're they're a huge, solid, fundamental base, and just that again, that visceral experience is so important, you know, for dexterity and for how you learn. And 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 digital can certainly augment it. I do think we're at a pivot point. I think that that you know, for what was created with Skylanders, and everyone sort of followed in, um, is is changing. And and I think there's a lot more uh, interactivity, whether it's what we're doing with with Mechanoid or Mission Drone or, or what. Uh, Sean's doing or what Caitlin's doing, right? I think that having much more physical inter- interactivity uh, is really important, so I think that's going to grow a lot. And uh, oh god, definitely there's going to be more uh, augmented reality when you've got 20 million daily uh, active users playing Pokemon Go. The, the size of the umbrella, like two weeks ago, people didn't know what augmented reality really was. Now everyone does because Pokemon defined it for them. Uh, so, yes. Yeah. There's, there's a tidal wave coming. So the next time I walk into a hair salon, I'll see Tokaboka hair salon cutter. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how about you, Sean? Uh, I would say two things that uh, I, I'm really, really excited about, and I think um, it's going to be sort of, sort of big uh, coming up. Is I would say first one is um, a networking effect. So right now, all of the products that we buy and all the products that we make sort of exist in their own verticals. They mostly exist in their own sort of like world. Um, and I don't think anyone's really sort of solved that magic that I think Apple had in the 90s, where when I bought 
one Apple product and then I bought a second Apple product, both products got better because they were both around. And I bought the third Apple product and then all three of them were better because I had the other two. Mm. Um, so right now I think that, set, that sort of network effect within the products where the products know about each other and react to each other and the total sort of play space and play experience expands it sort of becomes more than the sum of its parts. Um, I think it's a sort of a big thing no one's quite solved yet. And I'd say the other big one, um, touching a little bit on what Nick mentioned about with the, the sort of procedural gameplay, is um, emergent gameplay. You know, right now, a lot of the products we make, you know, we make a feature and it has like, you know, you do an action, you get a reaction, and sort of like, you know, if you talk to the designers of that product, they can describe every experience a customer is going to have with that product. So you can sort of draw a box around and say, when you purchase this, here's sort of the sum total of what that's going to be. And I think what we haven't, as sort of as an industry, done yet is sort of figure out what is, you know, for video games, what happened when you had, you know, massively multiplayer, when you sort of had that network, that sort of emerging gameplay, you think of like Minecraft, where, you know, a product where you, we have no idea what's going to happen, where sort of the systems and the features that we build can work together to create these sort of like, amazing experiences that we have no control over and we can't predict ahead of time. Um, I think video games have sort of gotten into that space and I think the sort of, uh, the sort of connected toys, living toys, toys to life segment is sort of just sort of seeing that over the horizon. So um, the costs of a small chip today, a processor, memory, input, output, costs today less than a dollar and it keeps on going down and the cost of sensors, uh, you know, connectivity solution it keeps on going down. And uh, to add to that, kids are just getting smarter and expecting more and more. So I think that what we're seeing today is only the beginning and um, I don't think toys are going to go away, physical toys, not at all. I think that they're just going to become smarter and smarter. Um, and just going back to Pokemon Go, um, so it's, it's free, but they came out with the bracelet, Pokemon Go Plus, um, retail $35, and it was sold out instantly. And so you have, you have the game for free, but you're still spending $35 to get the bracelet just because it's more convenient. You don't have to walk around with your phone. You can have that bracelet. So yeah, I think that the future is, um, there's going to be a lot of opportunities and great smart toys coming out. To add to that, um, I think technology getting cheaper is, is a big proponent, but also accessibility. Um, they just recently passed that, that it's, a, it's a right in the US to be able to have access to internet. Um, the more that, that we have ability to connect to these hubs with toys, um, the easier it will be to be able to use them in the car or um, maybe not at school, but in other areas of the children's life. And so um, I think there's, we're going to see more of a convergence of the actual physical aspect of toys and um, the screens and not look at them as two different platforms in the same way that for perhaps the Skylanders might where you're taking this physical character um, and looking at a screen and it doesn't, they're two separate experiences. They're, um, we're already seeing with the way that we're designing our products at LeapFrog that you can build additional interactivity using the electronics available to us now without screens into the toys. And so I think we're going to continue to see that everything around us will become a screen or you can tap into additional screens just um, by having touch points on a, on a toy. It doesn't necessarily need that type of um, reaction. And of course, we're seeing that with augmented reality now. Great. I think we got to cut it, cut it off. So we're, we're done. If there's any questions, I mean, I think there's lunch uh, between, between this and, uh, uh, and uh, the uh, lobby or wherever they're serving lunch. But if there are any questions, we're happy to take them on the panel, off the panel, whatever works. But please join me in thanking the group. Thank you.